Well, hello and welcome to the Spirited History Series. Today, we're going to be exploring Irish myths, legends, and superstitions. And I am your host, Leanne Ball. So let's get started. First, a little bit about me. If you're new to the Spirited History Series, I am your host, Leanne Ball. I'm a historian and folklorist, a retired radio host at one point, but then started my show back up again. So from 2008 into the present, I host a Spirited History Radio, heard live on the Para-X every Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm also a retired business owner. I created Creative Movement Connection which provided ancillary activities for uh, daycare centers and early childhood educators. I taught art, history, music, uh, a lot of very uh, unusual classes that uh, would uh, inspire children's creative juices to flow. Also, after 25 years, I did retire and became a historic site coordinator for two large scale locations here in Virginia. And my passion is not only education, but also our historic sites and the history that weaves around all of us and connects us all. I went full force into spirited history the last few years, offering educational programs, fundraising events, and we've raised over $65,000 for historic sites in our state of Virginia. And I also offer my um, expertise with historic research and I'm helping two uh, plantations here in Virginia explore and document their enslaved history, which is vital to the site's um, ongoing historic record. And I'll be uh, having one of my big projects last year, a historic marker for a local historic site installed this fall. So I will keep those updated on my Spirited History website. So today, since we are in the March of the Irish traditions with St. Patrick's Day, and also if you're a basketball fan, March Madness is getting ready to kick off. Today, we're going to jump right into myths and legends and superstitions. Myths, legends, and superstitions in Ireland kind of go hand in hand. Irish storytelling has been a staple of the culture since the dawn of time, with songs, tales, limericks spreading throughout the world as the Irish immigrated. One of our first myths and legends we're going to explore is Dullahan. This fairy is known in Irish mythology as a headless rider on a black horse. They carry their head in their arm. He is said to ride fast through the counties, and if he suddenly stopped, it meant that someone in that community was due to die. This legend gave inspiration for the character in Sleepy Hollow. He is commonly portrayed as either riding on the back of a black horse, also headless, or riding a black carriage that's pulled by six black horses. It is said that these horses ride so quickly and so ferociously that fire emanates from both their nostrils and their hooves as they strike the ground. The carriage that some believe he rides is made of coffins, tombstones, and bones, indicating his evil intent to take innocent lives. 
He bears a long black cloak that flows behind him as he rides through the lands, and he is known to hold his severed head high into the sky in search for the souls that he wishes to take. His severed head has a terrible appearance. It's covered in rotting flesh and gives off a strong odor of rotting cheese, and it has a complexion of stale dough. The mouth is split into a terrifying grin as he finds joy in taking the lives of others. His eyes are lit up with an evil fire and are darting back and forth, constantly looking for victims. So you definitely want to stay out of the dual hands uh, path. No lock gate stays closed when he approaches, bursting open to let the Dullahan through. He makes his way through towns, villages after dark, and the people hide in, um, in their houses and behind their curtains because if anyone were to even look at him, they would immediately be blinded. This he causes by whipping their eyes out with a whip made from a human spine or by throwing a basin of blood into their eyes. I mean, this is pretty gruesome. He has the ability to speak only once on a journey, and that is to say his name to the person whose life he wishes to take. Once the Dullahan states his name or that person's name, that person's soul is called to death, and there is no defying this call. There's nothing you can do. The Dullahan does this when he stops, and it is then that he will call the name of the victim, and that person then will expire. The Dullahan is believed to appear at sunset on certain festivals and feast days, which is when people know to be wary for your if you're going to be outside or looking outside after the sun goes down. The only thing that can frighten him is precious metal, which when thrown on the ground before him can cause him and his horse to suddenly stop in their path and turn and flee. During the period when the story of the Dullahan was most popular in Ireland, families were less likely to possess gold. As such, they were told to use their small amount of gold to frighten him if they called upon their house. So if you didn't have any, you were really out of luck if the Dullahan said your name. The Puka. Uh, so you want to be aware of these little shape shifting changers. The puka, the, these are some of the most feared creatures in Irish folklore. They're said to bring bad luck to those who saw them and were particularly feared around the times of the harvest. The puka is a changeling and can take uh, an animal or human form, like a horse, a donkey, a dog, cat, bull, young man, uh, uh, rabbit, or even a voluptuous young woman. The animal puka is usually jet black with fiery red eyes. They are often written as evil and bloodthirsty, and some associate pukas with the devil. Still, there are those tales of them warning humans of accidents or being har um, harassed as protection. November is the month of the puka. In Ireland of past, at Halloween, many children went out with puka, but others stayed indoors, fearful of stories that they had heard of what a puka did to children. And popular culture and other iconic mystical creatures are incarnated from puka. For example, the boogeyman is derived from puka. Also, the Easter bunny, which is pagan in origin, a fairy-like creature that brings chocolate eggs and sweets to children at Easter, has its roots in a fertility spirit theme of the puka. And you may be familiar with the name Puka from the film Harvey, uh, which had a uh, giant bunny that Jimmy Stewart had a relationship with named Harvey. Often appearing as a horse, Puka sometimes gallop across the countryside, knocking down fences and gates and destroying crops. In this form, Puka likes to take a rider, usually a drunkard, on a wild ride all night to shake him off in the gray of the morning. 
This person already heavily inebriated is also under the spell of the puka and has no recollection of what happened the night before. This often accounts for why some people having gotten very drunk report that they have no idea what happened to them the previous night. So you can kind of blame it on the puka. The only man to ever successfully ride a puka was High King of Ireland, uh, founder of the O'Brien dynasty, Brian Borama Mac Senteg, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, or more commonly known as Brian Baru Brian. Now he managed to control the magic of the creature by using a special bridle that used three hairs of a puka's tail. Brian's physical prowess meant that he was able to stay on its back until it, it actually exhausted the puka, which surrendered to Brian. The king forced it to agree to two promises. First, that it no longer tormented Christian people and ruined their property. And second, that it would never attack an Irishman. Well, except those who were drunk or were abroad with evil intent. So there we have our puka. Next, we have this beautiful goddess of the horses, Macha. And this is one of the best myths and legends of Irish folklore. Macha was an Irish war goddess, strongly linked to the land. Macha was the wife of Croniac. She was thought to be one aspect of the triple death, uh, um, death goddess, Morrigan the great queen or phantom queen, consisting of Macha, the raven, Bibe, the scald crow or coiling, and Nemund, the battle fury. Macha is associated with both horses and crows, and they often appear at the scene of a battle disguised as a raven or other bird-like creatures, and they would take a decisive role in the battle. There were three elements in matcha. The first was the maternal reproductive part. The second was the agrian element. And the third was the element of sexual virility. All three parts combined to form a mother goddess figure based on war and fertility. Next, we have pixies. Oh my goodness. This is for all the romantics out there. This Irish legend is about a leprechaun named Cole entering an evil uh, fairy lair, and he's going to encounter an evil fairy named Anya, who had transformed into this beautiful goblin. They spent hours talking until the empress of malevolent fairies cast a hex on Anya, turning her into a magpie. Cole consulted the queen of the good fairies, who promised to remove the spell if Cole found her and confessed his love. Eventually he did, and Anya was restored to her prior form. There are many tales of Anya. Lovely, lovely to read. Mermaids. We're very familiar with those. We've seen them in Hans Christian Andersen's writings, uh, Disney movies. The myth of mermaids in Southern Europe tells of fair-faced, beautiful women. Irish legends, however, described cold water mermaids as marrows or as pig-faced with sharp teeth. A mermaid is said to be formed when a woman was drowned in the creation of the Hlani, and they were also said to come ashore and have relationships with men before relieving, before leaving them and returning to the sea. Ah, this little fellow here, leprechauns. Leprechauns are figures in Irish folklore who are said to guard a hidden treasure. Regardless, this little uh, small and incredibly agile male fairy or goblin, uh, they do guard a pot of gold. Living as a solitary being, a leprechaun can be a source of mischief for the unwary. And they are infamous for being extremely difficult to catch or even trap. Even if they're caught, the captor must keep them always within sight 
um, or they will not give away the location of their treasure. Leprechauns share many characteristics with more ancient creatures from Irish Celtic um, legends and wider European mythology. But since the 19th century, they have risen to the dominant position of being the most recognizable symbol of Irish folklore. And here are some of their characteristics. They're thought to be uh, diminutive figures who are incredibly agile. They are male fairies or goblins. They typically live solitary lives. They usually appear in stories as guardians of hidden treasure. On other occasions, they are helpful spirits in the home. Dressed in green or red, leprechauns are usually old, wrinkled, and a little bit ugly. Unlike the modern representation of a chirpy leprechaun, the more traditional version is a little more stern and gloomy and sour tempered. Uh, a typical modern representation of a leprechaun as a little man sitting on a toadstool with a red beard and a green hat comes from a mix of elements seen in wider European folklore that is not part of the traditional Irish leprechaun character. Uh, most tales involve a familiar pattern with them. A human spies one busy repairing some shoes and demands to know where the pot of gold is, sometimes called a crock of gold after an earthenware pot. All the human has to do is keep his eye always on the leprechaun and he will be given the gold. And there lies the problem though. For leprechauns are nimble despite their age and they're prone to very mischievous tricks. The leprechaun can try any means to distract his captor, but his favorite technique, including playing on humanity's greed and their gullibility. The wily leprechaun is so successful in hanging on to his gold that the human who tried to gain it in the end usually only blames themselves for their own stupidity in not acquiring it. After the medieval period, leprechauns became the favorite of many writers who elevated them to a position of dominance. Uh, and they're higher than some of the Irish goblins and fairies that are not as well known. Which leads us into the fairies. When warrior tribes like the Milesians began to arrive in Ireland, the two Ade Danon were defeated in battle, but would not be forced to leave. They loved Ireland so much that they decided to use their magic to shrink themselves and live underground. The tunnels which you can see are believed to travel all over the country to different fairy villages. Each fairy village is marked by a single hawthorn tree or lone bush. The fairies are very secretive people who are blamed by the local Irish for many things which they cannot explain. As a result, the fairies like to be left alone and it's considered bad luck to disturb a fairy area or a lone bush area or a hawthorn tree. But they do love children and if you treat them well, they may grant you a wish at their fairy tree or lone bush. I'm gonna go into a little bit about fairy trees here. Uh, because this is a superstition as well. In Ireland, it's believed fairy trees are sacred grounds for the she, the people of the mounds, the fairy folk, uh, known as the little people, the wee people in Ireland. So what is a fairy tree? Okay, a fairy tree is usually a hawthorn tree or an ash tree. They stand alone in fields and are commonly found with large stones uh, circling its base, which in all actuality are there to protect it. What is mysterious about these large stones is how they came to be at the tree. And landowners are just don't even dare to touch the tree or to disturb the uh, rocks that are around it for fear of the wee folk. Ireland is a place of thousands of folklore stories and fairy trees are really common to this day. Some believe these trees are the gateway between the world of the mortals and that of the she, the fairies, the other world. In Irish mythology, it's split into four different cycles with a mythological cycle describing how the fairies, she, moved to the other world, as I told you before. 
Weefook had many entrances to the other world, such as burial mounds, underwater, the base of these fairy trees. As you can imagine, these gateways are extremely important for the movement of these Weefook. So they are heavily protected by magic. You wouldn't be considered mad if you just happened to spot a puka or a leprechaun at a fairy tree. However, it may bring strange looks by the locals who prefer not to speak of such places. So there are superstitions surrounding this uh, fairy trees. With fairy trees being regarded as a sacred site for the wee folk, there are many superstitions around them as you you know, probably guessed. And it involves not only magic, but bad luck. Some believe if you damage or cut one of these trees, you will be faced with a life of bad luck. And it's certainly common for farmers to work around these trees, even when they cannot grow crops where the tree stands. When traveling through Ireland, you often see a perfectly cultivated field and in the middle, an untouched fairy tree. And that's evidence that that farmer is not willing to risk his luck by doing anything to damage the tree. There are also stories around Ireland of roadworks being delayed because fairy trees would be in the path and workers who would refuse to touch the tree. And there have been instances where roads have been rerouted to go around or pass by the tree. And there's one famous story that I was able to find about the car manufacturer, DeLorean. And many think that they may have failed due to chopping down such a tree. So they got rid of a fairy tree. And when they built their car manufacturing plant near Belfast, the company was cursed with bad luck. And many attribute it to the cutting down of the fairy tree. Banshees. Maybe you've heard of the Banshee, written in Irish as Binji, uh, known culturally as the Woman of Death. It's said that if you hear her wailing and shrieking, that there will soon be a death of someone you know. She cries to warn the family of the upcoming death. So she's not actually causing the death. She's more of a warning. There are um, this, this wonderful uh, myth of the queen of the banshees, Kleena. She is the mythical queen of the banshees and spirits to the Tuda Danan and forever will be associated with the southern part of Ireland, Cork in particular. She was the goddess of love and beauty and is surrounded by three birds whose fabulous songs could cure all ills. Those who heard the songs were lulled into a deep sleep, and when they awoke, found that their sickness was cured. She was a fabulous beauty and perhaps the most beautiful woman in the world. But her tales are not so benign. She is said to have lured sailors to the sea where they would drown, and she's really unconcerned for the fate of mortals. Oh my goodness, we have a giant here. <laughs> the Dana uh, was the father god of the Tuna Dana. His position was esteemed and um, he was described as an ancient medieval uh, creature. He was a beautiful god of the heathens and he was worshiped for he was an earth god to them because of the greatness of his magical power. Uh, the data was uh, mystical uh, with his strength was derived from knowledge of the hidden in which folklore was the highest kind of wisdom. He possessed three particular implements of his magical power. First was a large bronze cauldron, which was so enchanted that no matter how many people sat down to eat around it, they would all be fed. Second was the mighty club that the data had carried with him. This enormous size meant that it had to be transported on wheels, and it took 10 men to lift it. One end of the club killed the living with one blow, while the other end could revive the dead. The third object 
that the data had was a magical living harp called, um, and it called the four angeled music. It was decorated in gold and jewels on which he could play music to inspire any mood. It was his playing on this harp that made it the seasons to um, remember to arrive in the proper order. This mystical instrument also played three types of music, the music of sorrow, the music of joy, and the music of dreaming. So even though he looks a bit um, scary here, he also provided a lot of positive things. Our next myth is Mana Amaclear, the mighty sea god of ancient Ireland. Now, this sea god of Irish mythology, and the name means son of the sea, and is regarded as an overlord to the Tuna de Dan. His famous boat, the Wave Sweeper, was a fantastic chariot drawn by the powerful horse and bar of the flowing mane, who could travel easily both on sea and land, and he used his chariot to transport beings from the mortal world to the other world, which he was guardian. Our next one that we're going to talk about is the Cúcólan. Um, there was a time in Ireland's history when chivalry and chieftainry ruled the land when the country was occupied by bands of warriors who spoke only their native tongue and who cherished their heritage and their civilization. This was the time for Carner McNessa, the high kings of Ireland. And it was a time of the Cuckahollan. All the warrior bands had their own special person responsible for recounting the deeds of times past, sort of a chronicler of the ages. The Kukholan was their most famous subject and hundreds of tales of his heroic deeds, both real and imagined have survived to this day. The Kukholan was a nephew and foster son of the King Connor of Emania and was originally named Sitana. He arrived at the court to find the youths playing, come on, which is uh, hurling, and having with him his red bronze hurley, which he so outplayed the other youths that this future greatness could be seen by all in the court. And the warrior, warriors of the red branch acknowledged him as a blood relative of the king and heard him proclaim before the druids in the hall of heroes. I care not whether I die tomorrow or next year, if only my deeds live on before me. Well, his greatest deed was perhaps when he alone held back the forces of Connaught and had to fight with his friend Ferdinand, who was the champion chief of the Knights of the Sword. So there are many wonderful tales of um, Kukolan, and I encourage you to look into some of these because they're really wonderful to read. And there are many that are documented. Our next interesting uh, legend is Fintan Mekbachra. This is a shape-shifting and the first man of Ireland. In the legends of old Irish mythology, uh, Fintan Macbachra was renowned as being, as I said, the first man in Ireland. He traveled with his granddaughter, uh, who was the granddaughter of Noah, named Kiesra, who escaped at the time of the Great Flood. Now, she had been refused entry into the Ark by her grandfather and so decided to create three Arks of her own to escape the impending deluge. When Kiesra was about 10 years old, her foster father, a priest of Egypt, told her to gather together a group and set out in order to escape the flood that was soon to follow. She built a fleet of three ships, which she populated with as many capable women as she could find, each of whom possessed a different skill. With her own father, Bith, she refused, she was refused entry onto the Ark, along with Fintan Macbachra and Laedra. Um, 
she was offered to bring three men to safety as long as they acknowledged her leadership. So she's going to try and take three men with her. They set sail for a land destined to known as Inishfald. So she was refused to get on the Noah's Ark, but she had her three and she took men with her, along with many women who had various duties. They hoped that since Ireland was yet unpopulated by any man, that no sin could have been committed there so that the place would be saved from the flood. And that flood was sent to cleanse the world of all evil. They had a very perilous journey. It took seven years, but they finally arrived in Ireland. And only one of their ships had survived the epic journey. This contained 50 women and three men. And among the survivors was Fintan McMacra. They decided to divide the women into three groups, each group to take one of the men to populate the new land. And they divided up the sheep they had brought with them, the first sheep of Ireland. And it, it, it's really an incredible story as it continues on to tell you what happens with our, our um, shape-shifting first man of Ireland. He did develop this gift. And he was, it was easy for him to transform from one animal to another. Uh, he gained much wisdom from being able to communicate with animals, especially by taking their um, physical form. And now we have this mysterious Kava, Druid King. And he served not only as an advisor to Kana McNessa of Ulster, but he also had means of checking the excessive use by the power of the king. So he could keep an eye on the king as well as advise him. The word druid can mean oak knower or oak seer. And the druids were often seen as members of this exclusive occupational class and also as sorcerers. It is generally accepted that the Druid was a type of intermediary, a conduit to the other world. Kava held the highest office at the court of the King Connor of Macnessa. And as was tradition at the time, no one was permitted to speak before the king, but even the king himself waited to hear first from Kava. His prophecies are pivotal in many of the stories of ancient time, uh, such as an occasion where um, he predicted that um, some would live a long life and some would live a short life. And um, it's, it's, it's really a good read if you go through the tales of this druid and find out what his um, Nostradamus-like predictions were but he is also one of the myths. Oh, you've heard me say this throughout our class today. The Tua de Danan, at the, the people of the goddess Danu were one of the great ancient tribes of Ireland and they had an important manuscript, the Annals of the Four Masters, which uh, records that they ruled Ireland from 1897 BC to 1700 BC. The arrival of the tribe in Ireland is really the stuff of legend. They landed in Connacht coastland, emerged from a great mist. And it is speculated that they burned their boats to ensure that they settled down in their new land. The rulers of Ireland at the time were the Firkspawak, and they were led by Ianoke, who was, needless to say, not very happy about their arrival. Uh, the Tua de Nanan uh, won eventually the, the battle there out of respect for the manner in which they had fought. They were, they actually allowed everyone to sort of remain in that area, but they would rule Ireland. The new rulers of Ireland were civilized, cultured people with new skills and traditions that were introduced into Ireland and were held in high regard by the peoples they conquered. Uh, they had four great treasures or 
talismans. They demonstrated their skills. The first was the stone fell, which would scream when a true king of Ireland stood on it. It was later placed on the hill of Tara, the seat of the high kings of Ireland. The second was the magic sword of Nua, which was capable of inflicting only mortal blows when used. The third was the slingshot of the sun god Luke, famed for its accuracy when used. And the final treasure was the cauldron of the data, which was that endless supply of food. So when the Milesians uh, came, this was sort of an invasion that pushed the Tuna Danan away. They were defeated and consigned into mythology. And legend has it that they were allowed to stay in Ireland, but again, only underground, lest they became the bearers of the fairies of Ireland, consigned to the underworld known as the Ashi, the people of the mound or the fairy mounds. There's also the Milesians, um, and we talk about their invasion, and um, there are some really good tales about the Milesians, uh, how they are a Celtic race of people, but I want to get to some of our superstitions too, so if I give you a little taste of, of some of these different uh, mythologies and um, traditions, maybe you'll um, look more into uh, what the Milesians are all about. Oh my goodness, Morrigan, oof. The shape-shifting phantom queen. She is one of the most mysterious figures in Irish mythology. The name Morrigan means phantom queen or great queen. Uh, she was associated with war, destiny, fate, and death. She was a shapeshifter and frequently appeared as a black crow, an ominous sign for those who saw her prior to battle. Legend has it that Morgan was in fact that triad of sisters, as I said before, Baib, Macha, and Niema. Yeah. While Morgan is also remembered as the triad of land, goddess Aidu, Bonva, and Fula. Her influence over the land of Ireland um, really developed uh, into naming the country. So she is a very, very famous and has many, many uh, stories about her um, powers and her victories over Cool Holland. So I really encourage you to read that story. Oh my goodness, we have Oisin, the land of eternal youth. Long ago in Ireland lived one of the most famous of the Finana, the warrior band of ancient mythology. Oisin was a poetic character who was well respected and loved by Fianna, and his sense of justice made him highly valued. He was worthy enough to be summoned by a fairy woman and his downfall lay in the love he had for his country and his people and his desire to return to them once more. Oshin was the son of Fen McComhill and the Sigil and was one of the brightest lights of the Finana. He was a skilled warrior, but also a poet and bard. And it said he wrote down many of the deeds of Finana with interests of historic record. Ocean um, had a strong sense of justice. He was one of the supporters of the Diamuj against his own father. And he, as he deemed Fen to be acting unfairly. His own mother, Sik Sikhasau, has been changed into a young deer, a fawn by the Druids. And, um, and that was because she was refusing advances. So she was turned into a fawn. Fen had been hunting and caught the fawn, but refused to kill his prey, who then magically changed back into human form. They wed and Sisal was with child. 
Alas, the story of Ocean's mother was not to be a happy one as the druid once again changed her back into an animal form after which she fled into the wild. Uh, and I sort of reflect back to the Disney movie Tangled with the enchantment of the mother and being turned into, um, I think, a bear, which was interesting. So we have this one, uh, a mother being transformed into a fawn. So there are many stories uh, with this um, uh, ocean and it's really um, a fascinating read. All right, the messages of butterflies. According to Irish folklore, butterflies are said to move between the worlds to bring messages and warnings. They are said to be souls waiting to be reborn on earth. Butterflies with dark wings are said to warn of bad news, such an, as an attack or a failed crop. Uh, white and yellow butterflies were told to bring good news, such as birth or success. The harp is said that evil gods stole the first harp from the Dega, the king of Irish Celtic mythology. The lack of music in Ireland caused sadness to pass over the country until the Dega returned to art to cheer them up. So he returned the uh, harp. Eventually, the evil gods gave it back and the joy returned to the land. This is how the harp became a national icon of Ireland and became cemented in folk music tradition of Ireland. So we have our harp. You remember, the data had three things, the cauldron, the harp, and the club. Our shamrock, again, three. St. Patrick's teaching tool. This three-leafed clover is very important in Irish legend and it's the spread of Christianity. It concerned St. Patrick as he tried to educate the Celts on the Holy Trinity, um, but they were having trouble understanding it and what he was really trying to say to them. So St. Patrick saw the clover before him and decided to use it to explain the three strands of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as one. The Celts finally understood what he meant, and that's how the shamrock became so important in the Irish history. Now, let's get into some Irish superstitions and see how many you've heard of or that you practice. All right. It is considered bad luck to do the following. Put shoes on a table or chair. I practice that. Place a bed facing the door. Bring lilacs into the house. And I tried to look up why lilacs, could not find it. If anyone knows, please email me at spiritedhistory at gmail.com. I would like to know. Uh, it's bad luck to cut your fingernails on a Sunday. Give a knife as a gift or wear green, except for that little bit of green for St. Patrick's Day. We don't want to get pinched. If a bird flew into a house, it was a portent of death. It is unlucky to knit at night until you were certain the sheep were asleep. If a child was born before noon, he or she would not be able to see spirits or the good people. But if born at night, the child would have the gift, meaning the psychic ability. Thinking of building an extension onto your home? It's supposed to be unlucky to extend from the rear, especially if it faces west. This belief probably originated in the Ireland Isles where they were reluctant to build in that direction because of the weather. The story goes that one family defied this custom with tragic results. Two of their menfolk were lost at sea and a third went mad. Livestock fairs are still widespread in Ireland, and it's a common practice to give a luck penny, which means returning the portion of the sale price to the seller when the deal is made. The deal is then settled by spitting onto the palm and slapping the hand of the customer. Interestingly, a man's status in the area is often determined by the size of the lucky penny he's in the habit of giving. And now I think with our pandemic, I wonder how this tradition will be handled.
From the country folk came a wealth of beliefs related to physical ailments. For example, a stocking filled with hot potatoes and applied to the throat cured tonsillitis. Shaving on Sunday encouraged a toothache, but carrying a haddock's jawbone helped to prevent it. I don't know why a haddock's, but there you go. Boiled daisies are said to relieve sore eyes. Milk in which kelp had been boiled could cure boils. And unsalted butter rubbed on a stitch on the side could make it go away. And as for warts, they could be cured by rubbing them with a fresh cut potato and burying the potato in the garden. And I do know with the daisies, there are a lot of uh, Appalachian recipes and remedies with that. And not so much potatoes, but onions with the um, on your throat and chest. Still more colorful superstitions surround the sea and weather. So here we go. Changing the name of the boat was said to change its luck and coins dropped overboard could cause a storm. So you wanna keep your change in your pocket. Fishermen considered it unlucky to keep the first salmon of the season. Big shoals of herring foretold a plentiful harvest. Three boats were lashed together when leaving the harbor because it was bad luck to be the third boat out. Along the North Coast, some of the catch was always left on board. Sharks should not be hunted on Sunday. No family called Cregan or Carrie would be ever be drowned. Don't know about that. Greedy Pollock were a sign of bad weather. A coal thrower after a fisherman as he bored his boat brought good luck and he always boarded from the right and in Wicklow the fishermen always put to sea in a sunwise direction. There's some logic to some of these beliefs especially those regarding the movement of marine life like uh, birds being a sign of bad luck, uh, porpoises swimming near shore, lobsters and crabs on rocks or seagulls or other seabirds flying inland were really all portents of stormy weather and seen as bad luck to put out to sea if you observe their movement. And it's just natural for them to do this right before stormy weather. There were special beliefs surrounding important dates on the calendar. Uh, pipes were never uh, lit from the hearth fire on May Day, nor were embers taken outdoors. Also, if you drank nettle soup on May 1st, it's believed that you would be free of rheumatism for a year. If you pick a flower on May Eve, it's said that the fairies will come and take you away with them. So do not pick flowers on May Eve. It's unlucky to go on a trip both to both St. Martin's Eve and the Feast of St. Martin, November 10th and the 11th. So no trips. On Epiphany, January 6th, the tail of a herring was rubbed across the eyes of children to protect them from disease for the rest of the year. Mm, I wonder how they felt about that. On St. Brigitte's Day, February 1st, uh, the straw from the Christmas nativity scene was put into the rafters to help protect against evil spirits and also to cure a ringworm. <coughs> Whatsuntai was associated with drowning, and there would be those who would not put out to sea unless a boat was steered by a new bride. I, what is the significance of Whitsuntai? Um, while it may not be widely known or celebrated as Christmas or Easter, Pentecost is one of the most significant dates on the Christian calendar. This festival commemorates the coming of the Holy Spirit to the disciples following the death of Jesus Christ. On Good Friday, while little work was done in observance of the crucifixion, it was a lucky day to sow potatoes. On All Souls Day, November 2nd, people avoided taking shortcuts for fear the good people would lead them astray. Other days in the year had special beliefs attached to them. Saturday in particular, uh, it was considered unlucky to move house, get married, begin a project, or even take a journey overnight on Saturdays. When Christianity came to Ireland, the symbol of the hair was used deliberately 
to transfer the pagan religion into the Christian context, especially at Easter. As harbingers of spring, hares were held in high esteem, and over time, the Easter hare became the Easter rabbit or bunny, uh, far less threatening um, to Christian Ireland than at the ancient pagan symbol. If a cat strayed into your house, every effort was made to make it stay. But if a family moved, the cat was left behind. It was also believed that if you, you really shouldn't look at a cat who had just been wiping its face with its paws, whoever the cat looked at would be the first in the household to die. Yikes. Crows flying directly over a home were also an omen of death. Remember crows or ravens at battle too was a, a negative outcome if you saw them. And there was an old Irish saying, say, God between us and all harm was always said on hearing a crow or a rooster. And you can't help but think, well, maybe that's a throwback to the betrayal of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Maybe. <laughs> Besides the rabbit's foot carried for good luck, a lucky horseshoe, a real one, was positioned above the door and was used for good luck. It's placed with its points up so the luck would not run out. Even today, Irish brides make sure there's a lucky horseshoe included in their ensemble, perhaps a small fabric one sewn into the hem of their gown or may, maybe carried on some fabric around their wrist or somewhere on their outfit. If you find a horseshoe, shoe, you're supposed to spit on it and throw it over your head and you'll have good luck. You'll have good luck, but if there's anyone behind you, I don't know if they'll have good luck. Crossed knives on the countertop. You better uncross them immediately or else you're going to have an argument in the house. If you break a looking glass, you're supposed to have seven years of bad luck. And that one, I think a lot of people practice. If you spill salt on the table, you will have a fight. So knives and salt, beware. If a person comes in one door, they should go out the same door again. Otherwise, they say they take away the luck with them as they go out the other door. If you find a four-leaf shamrock, you will be lucky. If you hear ringing in your ear, they say it's the souls in purgatory who are calling for your prayers. If your right ear is hot, it's a sign that someone will scold you. When sparks fly out of the fire, it's a sign that you'll get money. Ooh. If you see a tea leaf floating on top of your tea, it's a sign that you will get a letter. If your nose is itchy, it's a sign that someone is speaking ill of you. If scissors fall on the floor, you will get a disappointment. If the palm of your hand is itchy, money is coming to you. If you drop a fork, you will have company. And this one my grandmother always um, talked about. If you see a white horse in the morning, you will have good luck. When you see a white horse, spit and close your eyes and you'll have good luck. Be sure to rub out the spit afterwards. So yeah, she would always talk about um, when we would go to see her, she lived uh, in Asheville, North Carolina, and we would always look during the day in the early morning hours for white horses on some of our outings. So it's kind of fun finding that. If you count the cars at a funeral, bad luck will befall you. If you meet a funeral, you should walk three steps behind it. If you do not, you will have ill luck. If you burn a pack of playing cards, bad luck will befall you. If the Christmas candles do not burn straight on Christmas, there will be bad luck in the house during the coming year. If you find a hairpin, keep it and you will get money. If you put your stockings inside out, you will be lucky. As Irish immig immigrants immigrated throughout the world, 
they brought their folklore with them. They soon became one of the greatest storytelling countries in the world. And I highly recommend looking into some of these myths, legends, and superstitions. It's really interesting to see where they have come. And maybe if you're adopting some of them or you've heard them, or they're parts of other stories that have been incorporated like the Headless Horseman. I do recommend these books, Irish Cures, Mystic Charms, and Superstitions by Lady Watt. The Old Days, Old Ways, an Illustrated Folk History of Ireland by Alice Sharkey. And Celtic Tales, Fairy Tales, and Stories of Enchantment from Ireland, Scotland, Brittany, and Wales by Kate Forrester. I have been your host, Leanne Ball, with Spirited History, which is heard live every Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Para-X Radio Network. You can also find us on our website at spiritedhistory.com. And if you want to send us an email with some questions, it's spiritedhistory at gmail.com. I want to thank you so much for having me as your host today. Thank you and good night.